Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is Concepts Lecture 20 on Roland Barthes, Semiotics, and Phenomenology. Barthes wrote on a wide variety of subjects. He started as an historian. He wrote on literature, popular culture, film, photography, and he used a wide variety of approaches and invented um, a wide variety of approaches himself. Um, here, I'm just going to use this work as a starting place uh, to consider two of the main theories that he elaborated, semiotics and phenomenology. Some of his early work takes a semiotic approach, meaning that it decodes objects, artworks, places, people, uh, to reveal how they create meaning. There's an essay called Rhetoric of the Image, published in 1964, uh, which is especially famous in this regard. He analyzes an advertisement to see what he calls its codes or its levels of meaning. This is the advertisement he analyzes for Panzani Pasta. So here are the codes that he finds in this, according to this essay. First of all, there's a linguistic message. Uh, that's the text, both the caption and also the labels that you see on the products. And he notes the literal meaning, pasta, sauces, and parmesan, and also the connotation. They represent Italian culture to French consumers. The second level or code is the symbolic message. This is part of the non-linguistic portion of the ad, and he mentions several different examples. First of all, the mesh bag implies that the shopper has just returned home. The tomatoes and the peppers um, also help signify Italian cooking. And the entire composition is reminiscent of a painted still life, which gives consumers the impression that if they buy Panzani products, their lives will be, you know, like artworks. Then there's the uncoded message. That's the visual presence of tomatoes, peppers, and cheese, and the packages, and so on. For Bart, um, they're, they're uncoded because a tomato just signifies tomato and nothing more. It just is what it represents. In another essay on photography, he asks what would happen if we subtracted even the uncoded message. So say we came from Mars, we came from a culture that didn't recognize pasta or tin cans or packages of parms or anything like that. In that case, the image would just be formal elements, colors, shapes, and it would be entirely outside language and codes. These two essays, this rhetoric of the image and the other one here that I'm drawing from, they're both, they're both really eccentric and they kind of paint him into a corner because if you think this way, if you try to subtract away codes or, or levels of meaning or language uh, and connotation and so on, you end up in this funny place where you really can't say anything. It's, it's a little bit like what I talked about in uh, Concepts Lecture uh, 2 about the relation between language and images, because in this case, um, he thinks he's thinking in such a way that he's subtracting away everything that he could put into language, and he ends up in a place where he can't say anything. It's a strange way of thinking about how uh, images are structured. I have a couple screens here to introduce semiotics in a more formal way. Semiotics is the study of signs, how one thing stands for another. Um, and I'm going to list some common terms on this page. In semiotics, um, it's useful to know that when something is to be considered as a sign, it's enclosed in these double slashes that are called virgules. Okay, so if I enclose that first cat in virgules, it means that I'm not talking about an actual cat. I'm not referring, trying to use that sign to refer to something to say anything, but I'm trying to consider its function as a sign. I'm considering it as a sign. So the first uh, element of semiotics is the sign itself. And here are a couple of synonyms for that, because there are a lot of synonyms in semiotics. Uh, but the basic uh, unit of meaning of semiotics, the basic subject of semiotics, is the sign. And that's a perfectly good way of referring to it. Then there's also the idea of a cat. And again, this is written with slashes, with virgules to indicate that I'm not actually concerned about cats or ideas, but I'm concerned about this phrase, the idea of a cat. So that first um, 
silhouette of a cat signifies the idea of a cat. So it is the signified, as it's called in semiotics. And then there's the artist who draws that, or the person who sees the drawing, and that is called the interpretant. So this, at first, at first, if you've never seen this before, it can seem um, abstract and really obscure, but it's actually very uh, straightforward, and that's why semiotics is so useful and so widely uh, adopted. There are always signs for things, whether or not they're words or, or silhouette um, pictures, icons, whatever, and those signs always signify something. Uh, and then there's always somebody who's doing the reading or interpreting. So sign, signified, interpretant. Charles Peirce, that's the way his name is pronounced, was an American philosopher and a scientist who developed a complicated theory of semiotics. In art theory, he's mostly known for his idea that there are three kinds of signs, iconic, symbolic, and indexical. Iconic signs resemble what they signify. So that silhouette resembles a cat. That's um, one of the paintings by the artist team of Comar and Melamed, where they did a survey to find out what people wanted in their ideal painting. And they gave them answers like Washington and a lake and some deer. And then they painted something which had all those things in it. So everything in this resembles something that someone had asked for. So these are all iconic signs. And in general, realistic, naturalistic landscape painting is iconic. So it's full of iconic signs. The tree looks like a tree. The lake looks like a lake, sort of, more or less. The second kind of sign, according to Peirce, are symbolic. These are signs that work by convention. So we agree that the written word cat in English signifies that animal, or the sounds of the word cat signify the animal. Symbolic signs are dependent on language and customs and culture. They don't resemble what they denote. And the last of the kinds of signs is indexical. These are directly caused by whatever it is that they signify. So smoke from a chimney signifies that there's a fire in the hearth. The smoke doesn't resemble the fire. That would make it an iconic sign. And the smoke doesn't signify the fire, doesn't mean fire, just because we agree in English uh, that it does, because that would make it a symbolic sign. So smoke from a chimney is not a symbolic sign, it's not an iconic sign, so Peirce says it's an indexical sign. Another example that he uses is, um, is a, a wax seal. So if you have a, a seal and you press it down in wax, it makes an impression of whatever it is you have on the seal. Or if you want to think of um, printing, you print something and you, and you look at the print and it's physically caused, that print is physically caused by whatever you had put in your, your intaglio, your etching. Uh, or whatever you had engraved into your seal and so on. So in that case, the seal is an indexical sign of the print that you've made. Peirce's system became important in art theory when the art historian Rosalind Krauss claimed that photography as a medium is indexical. Photographs signify, she said, because they're physically caused by photons striking the film, or the CCD. So that makes photography unlike painting, which is not physically caused by whatever it represents. If I'm outside painting and I'm painting a landscape like that Komar and Melamed thing, I look at the tree and I paint the tree, but it's not that, that what I paint is not physically caused by the tree. There's a really complicated um, chain of cause and effect. I have to see it, I have to think about it, I have to move my hand and all the rest of it. But in photography, it's, it's Krauss's claim that something fundamentally different happens because the photograph is physically caused by the photons that directly strike the photograph. It's a contentious claim, it's an interesting claim, um, and it was an attempt on her part to set photography apart from other media. Krauss and others only use a very simple version of Peirce's theory. Peirce actually had a wildly complicated theory. Uh, he actually said, every sign combines index, symbol, and icon. And when he said that, he gave a really strange and confusing example, which I'm going to quote here just as a kind of a reminder or a warning or something that a lot of the theorists that get used in the art world get used in a really simplified way. 
it's kind of nice to think of icon index symbol. They're kind of easy to remember and, they're, and they, the kinds of signs are really quite different. But this is Purse's example. Take for instance, it rains. Here the icon is the mental composite photograph of all the rainy days the thinker has experienced. The index is all whereby he distinguishes that day as it is placed in his experience. The symbol is the mental act whereby he stamps that day as rainy. I absolutely cannot understand that paragraph, no matter how many times I read it. But it is easy to understand that an iconic sign resembles what it denotes, and a symbolic sign is uh, an agreed upon convention, and an index is a sign that's physically caused by what it denotes. I have two more slides here, really just to show the craziness of Peirce's theory, because he's an interesting person all by himself. He's an extreme example of uh, elaborations of theories uh, that haven't been used by the art world. So he defined sign not just three times, but actually at least 76 times. And he also tried to elaborate it beyond what any human, including he himself, could understand. Uh, this table is his nine basic uh, kinds of signs. Uh, he loved dividing things into three. So you could see icon, index, symbol. Um, he called those first, second, and third. And then he also had three categories, signs in themselves, signs in relation to objects, signs in relation to the interpreter. This is actually comprehensible, but what he did next, I think, is not. He then made a chart with 10 combinations, and he named each one. You could see in the right-hand column there his examples of all these different kinds of signs. And then he divided this table into 66 categories of signs, which I'm not going to show. And then he divided those into 3 to the 10th, or 59,049 kinds of sign. But he decided to postpone studying those 59,049 signs because he said they would be difficult to carefully consider. <laughs> so that's just my little, um, that's, that's my little detour um, into purse. Sometimes the, the theorist's craziness is more interesting than the uh, parts and pieces that are picked up in the art world. Another important semiotician is Nelson Goodman, an American philosopher. He argued against the idea that an artwork has to resemble something, or has to be naturalistic, in order to represent that thing. He was interested in separating denotation from resemblance and representation. If you're interested in those, there's more on those in the Concepts Lecture 4. So for example, he wrote about music notation. He says music notation denotes a music performance, but of course it doesn't resemble a music performance. Part of the idea of this separation, to separate denotation from resemblance, part of the notion here is to not privilege any particular kind of sign system. In this book, Languages of Art, he formulated some detailed analyses of, of very different systems of, of um, denotation. Music notation was one of them. Laban notation that's used in dance was another one. He analyzed pictures, but also graphs and charts and so on. He was interested in their syntactic differences. That means differences in their structure as opposed to their way of referring to the world. That would be semantics. Syntax um, in semiotics and also in linguistics. Syntax means relations among parts of an artwork how the parts of your photograph work with each other or the parts of your performance work with each other. And semantics means the relationship between the artwork and the world, how your photograph or performance relates to or refers to the world. Pictures, Goodman said, for example, are more replete than graphs. That's because in a graph like that one, you can change an awful lot of things and it will still mean the same. You can make the lines thicker, you can make them a different color, you can change the font. You could even distort that graph and it would still have all the same information in it. But um, pictures, visual artworks, are more replete, meaning every little change can make a difference. Replete symbol systems, like paintings, like a lot of visual art, are also very likely, he said, to have dense signs. That means like brush marks that blend into one another as opposed to um, letters or something that have spaces between them. So those are just some examples of the things that he studied. Uh, there are many more distinctions in that book, Languages of Art. Um, it's a very uh, democratic way of thinking about things. He was really only interested 
in the logical structures or systems, as he called it, of denotation, no matter where they were to be found, fine art, low art, engineering, graphs, whatever it was. So a little bit about the other major theory that Roland Barthes also practiced, phenomenology. This is Barthes' book on photography. It's still the most read book on photography theory. Phenomenology is a 20th century school of philosophy that's mainly associated with the philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Phenomenology emphasizes our conscious awareness of our actual lived experience as we encounter the world from within our own bodies. Phenomenologists don't believe in objective scientific truth. They're interested in how we actually experience things, walking around, seeing it from inside our bodies, as it were. I give you a couple examples of phenomenological truths. The moon is actually a quarter of a million miles away, but there was a survey conducted by a very interesting uh, natural philosopher, Marcel Minert, whose book you can find on Amazon. And uh, that uh, survey indicated that when the moon is down near the horizon on a clear night, most people think of it as being about a half a mile away. The survey would just ask people to ignore whatever they thought they knew about science and just to say, well, how far away does it look? And the general, the best answer, I guess, the, I, mean, the, I mean, the commonest answer was half a mile. Here's another example of a phenomenological truth. The, the scientific understanding of rainbows is that they're caused by individual droplets in the air. So a rainbow appears differently to each person. And actually, a rainbow is a cone in space. It leads from your eyes out into space wherever there are droplets in the air. But of course, phenomenologically, rainbows are flat and far away. They're not necessarily close to you, but rainbows can be right up against your face or very far. And they actually, if you could, if you could um, magically step outside yourself and look at what you were seeing, you would see a cone, not a flat object. So phenomenology rejects perspective space because that's too rational and scientific. That's a drawing by Leonardo. And also perspective space excludes the body of the person experiencing the space because when you draw a perspective, um, you really are imagining that, it's, that the scene is observed from a single unmoving geometrical point. This particular scene is not, is not uh, observed by a body the shape and size of Leonardo's. It's observed by anybody because the, the, the act of observing is reduced to a single geometrical point. And that is not a phenomenological uh, truth. Phenomenologically, you're always breathing and walking around and your, oh, your body influences the way you experience things. Merleau-Ponty was much more interested in experiences that don't correspond to science um, or to Euclidean space. I just took, chose this Miro because it has a kind of uh, children's ladder, I guess, which is the kind of thing that, of course, Leonardo wouldn't draw. In his book on photography, Bart says he's a phenomenologist, and, and, he, and he was, largely, and he says he rejects photography that's not phenomenological. He says he can't respond to photographs that aren't of people, in particular, and he mentions Harold D. Edgerton, for 50 years, he says, Harold D. Edgerton has photographed the explosion of a drop of milk to the millionth of a second. Little need to admit that this kind of photography neither touches nor even interests me. I am too much of a phenomenologist to like anything but appearances to my own measure. So what he's talking about is images like this. Edgerton was an engineer who worked at MIT, and he's most famous for these stop-motion photographs of things like bullets going through balloons and and uh, milk droplets, uh, things like that. So this is something that is not, quote, to the measure of human experience. It's something beyond that. So uh, Bard thinks of it as not phenomenological. It's a kind of photography he's not interested in because it uh, doesn't correspond to an actual lived experience. He's implying that because of the, the camera that Edgerton developed um, and the flash, um, whereas making exposures as short as a millionth of a second, um, then it was recording things that no human could experience, either too fast, too large, or too small, anything like that. And that's why he said that he's interested in mostly in 
photographs of people. There's Edgerton looking at one of his bullets going through a balloon, or it looks like he's looking at it. But images like Edgerton's and, and just scientific images in general, because that's what's really at stake here, uh, they are still things that we perceive with our bodies. Edgerton doesn't see that bullet, but uh, he could hold the print, just like we can look at this, uh, look at this uh, digitized, the digital scan of the print, and we can relate all of this to our own experience. If it were an actual print, you could also relate the physical size of the print to your own experience. In this sense, there isn't anything outside phenomenology. What Bart meant by phenomenological was really just human scaled. And that's a fairly typical, um, typical of the interest of phenomenology. Phenomenology still remains the principal theory that takes the viewer's body into account. Phenomenology is much more common than semiotics in contemporary art theory because critics often try to remain aware of their own bodies in relation to artworks and how their own movements and positions affect what they say about the art. Those are both phenomenological concerns. This is uh, especially common in art criticism of performance art, but it happens in art criticism of all different uh, fields. Um, that's any time a critic reminds you or reminds themselves of where they are, how they stand, whether they're tired, and how they're looking around, and what it was like to come into the gallery, and all the rest of those things. They're thinking phenomenologically, and if they pursue that, then they will start saying things like, I, my experience of this changed my mind about what this work is, because when I came into the gallery, it took you know, three steps to get to the object, it was much smaller than I thought, that kind of thing. Those are phenomenologically motivated um, conclusions. So there's more to say about BART, and so I'm going to um, leave that here and come back to it in lecture 22.